<laughs> All right. So, yeah. So today we're going to continue with discussing circuit complexity and connections uh, between complexity and algorithms. So this is the much anticipated part two. So uh, last time we were talking about a uh, connection between circuit set and circuit lower bounds. And we were just describing at a high level um, the connection. So uh, as we were saying, a slightly faster algorithm for CSAT, one running in, say, 2 to the n over n to the 10 for all polynomial sizes, would get us a function in an x that does not have polynomial size circuits. OK? And um, so we, we discussed that this connection is quite generic, that depending on what circuit class you can solve the SAT problem for, you will get a different kind of circuit lower bound. Okay? So if you get a circuit set algorithm running in this much time, you get a strong lower bound. Now, it would be weaker to give a formula set algorithm because formulas are for a special case of circuits. So if you merely could just get a faster formula set algorithm, you would prove formula lower bounds for uh, functions in, in X. And, and so on, like if you had ACC set algorithms, which I sketched a couple lectures ago, you would have lower bounds. A function in X does not have small ACC circuits. And I also discussed uh, that you don't have to solve the SAT problem in its full uh, generalization. You just have to distinguish between unsatisfiable circuits and ones which have, say, at least half of their assignments satisfying deterministically. Again, this is a problem which can be solved efficiently with randomness just by random sampling inputs and you know, seeing if any of them are satisfiable. Okay? That would still uh, get you uh, in X not in P poly. Okay? So, all right, and so we'll see the proof that in X is not in ACC uh, later on here. So the converse. That, so we, before we were talking about how circuit analysis algorithms imply circuit lower bounds, the converse is can lower bounds imply algorithms? And so Russell has been talking at length about these kinds of connections, connections between circuit lower bounds and derandomization. So you know, given uh, circuit lower bounds, you can derandomize, randomize algorithms, make them deterministic. So for example, uh, X not MP poly implies BPP is in sub-exponential time, very infinitely often. So, but for restricted circuit classes, sometimes the techniques that were used to prove circuit lower bounds, so uh, in order to prove a circuit lower bound, some property, some nice property of that circuit was found, and that nice property can often be leveraged to get a set algorithm for the same circuit class. So here's just a canonical example of this. If we look at Boolean formulas over and, or, and not, the ands and ors have fan and two. This is the class of De Morgan formulas. Uh, way back in the 60s, Sobotovskaya showed that the mod two function, the parity function on n bits, can't be computed with essentially into the 1.5 size Boolean formulas with and, or, and not gates using uh, the so-called random restriction method. So if you, if you randomly set uh, a randomly chosen subset of variables into the formula and simplify it, you actually find that the formula shrinks by some uh, non-trivial amount. Okay? And so the thing is, if you set, for example, all but one of the bits uh, to a formula that's supposed to compute the mod 2 function, it had better be that the whole formula doesn't simplify to a constant. Because even if I, see if I set even n minus 1 bits on something computing the mod 2 function, the last bit will still determine the output. Right? The last bit will, fire, will tell me what, whether the sum is even or odd. So if I choose like n minus 1 of, uh, or if I choose one of the inputs at random and set all the others randomly, if that whole thing shrinks, like simplifies to a, a constant function, it could not compute mod 2. And essentially that's what Subotovskaya showed was that um, that formulas of, of this size, if you sort of hit them with a random restriction on all but one of the bits, it's going to simplify to a constant with high probability. Okay? So we couldn't compute the mod 2 function, for example. But this had 
have been improved to uh, in squared size. But uh, in 2011, Raul Santanam used a strengthening of Subotovskaya's argument to show that the SAT problem for linear size Boolean formulas with n and OR gates can be solved in less than to the n time. And the idea uh, in retrospect is, is sort of uh, a concentration version of the random restriction lemma. So really what Rahul is doing is just taking a, a very natural algorithm for branching. You pick a variable that occurs most often and you try to set it to false and you recurse, you try to set it uh, to true, you recurse, you do some basic simplifications like if if you have an or of a variable and it's engaged and something like that, then you simplify it. And what you end up saying is that uh, if I if I hit a, a formula, a linear size formula with a random restriction and leave some variables unset, not only does it simplify to a constant with you know, some probability, it simplifies to a constant with super high probability. So if you think about it from the point of view of a branching algorithm, um, what I'm saying is that like, if I, like on the vast majority of the branches, all but exponential small fraction of the branches, the entire thing's going to simplify to a constant, in which case I would have determined whether or not the formula was sat on that branch. And so the, the branching ends early in this, in this respect. So like setting uh, a bunch of variables at random makes the thing simplify to a constant fast, then you don't have to branch so far. That, that's, that's the main intuition behind what Rahul did, strengthening this, uh, the ingredients using this lower bound. And this has since been strengthened by many others, the, the same basic uh, intuition. So, for example, there's a whole paper that, that uh, gives lots of different arguments of this kind uh, with Valentin and Antonina. And uh, is there anyone else from here in the audience? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, Jen being the, the main author. So m mining circuit lower bound proofs for meta algorithms. So, uh, the, so go check out their paper. There's lots of... There's also this kind, where you can kind of systematically take circular round proofs, uh, strengthen them a little bit, and then get things like set algorithms, or as they like to call them, compression algorithms, out of it. And so one thing I would like to just note in passing is that you can also mine circuit lower bound proofs, the ideas behind them, to get algorithms for problems that have nothing to do with set, nothing to do with circuits. They're actually problems that people in algorithms want to solve. Uh, you know, or people who you know, study, who go to soda all the time, really want to solve. So, for example, if you uh, study this polynomial method of Rosbroff and Smolensky, uh, which I, I had this one slide outline of uh, how Rosbroff and Smolensky can take constant depth circuits and uh, translate them into low degree polynomials, you can use this to get faster algorithms for many other problems, uh, which don't have to do with uh, circuits. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can use this to solve the all pair shortest paths problem in n cubed over about to the square root log n time. Now, Virginia discussed this uh, briefly, but she didn't say really how it was obtained, and it was really obtained by taking one of the slides from, my, from what I was talking about for AC zero set algorithm and uh, basically applying it in the right way to solve all pair shortest paths. Okay. Um, so other things you can do is like solve this orthogonal vectors problem or equivalently find a disjoint pair of sets in a set system, um, compute partial match queries, evaluate a CNF formula. Um, you can find longest common substring that don't cares in about n squared over to the square root log n time where n is the length of the two uh, strings. So um, you can solve a zero one integer programming much faster than to the end time. You can't get 1.9 to the end time. That would contradict strong ADH, but you can get something much faster than to the end. And recently, uh, with Josh Allman, we, um, we found some even stronger results. Uh, we basically proved some new uh, probabilistic polynomial uh, theorems and used this to find the closest pair of points in the Hemming metric. So I, can, I will say in a little more detail what it is we actually, we'll leave this here for now. Uh, we actually proved. So in this, um, 
And this problem, finding the closest pair of points, has been studied for many, many decades. I think it, it appears uh, in Minsky and Papert's uh, book on perceptrons from the 60s. So you have, let's say, two kinds of points, say n red points and n blue points. And let's say they're in C log n dimensions. Okay? Now these points are in the Boolean hypercube, so they're all 0, 1. Okay. They have C log n dimensions. That's sort of the case the, where C is greater than 1. That's the case where it starts to become interesting. And you want to find uh, a red point and a blue point with uh, minimum Hamming distance. Okay. Okay. So just find you know, the ones with the fewest number of bits which differ. All right. So I mean, this problem comes up in many, many different contexts. What we can show using uh, probabilistic polynomials is that so for every constant c, you can find this uh, closest pair in the Hemming metric and in the 2 minus order uh, log c time. So n squared times the dimension would be the naive way to do it. Okay. Uh, if you had a really large dimension, you could use a matrix multiplication to get like n, you know, uh, something like n squared, you know, maybe or n to the omega, or something like that. Like if, no matter what the dimension was, using matrix mul. But here you can actually get something truly subquadratic as long as c is some constant. Okay. And actually, the dependence is not so bad. I mean, it's log of that. Okay. So, and this really comes from uh, finding a probabilistic polynomial for the majority function. Um, so this is, so this is uh, with uh, Josh. I, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, you could, you know, study circuit complexity, you know, I mean, if you're just purely interested in finding better algorithms, you might find a better algorithm for your pet problem, and it may have nothing to do with circuit sat or, or, or anything like that on the face of it. But you know, uh, to to a complexity theorist, you know, everything looks like a certain kind of circuit. So, so that's maybe the the trick behind most of these results. Okay. If you look at things in the right way, you can turn them into circuits. Okay. Are there any questions about like the the, the if you want a little more details, yeah. Can you say a little bit about what all those problems have in common? Or what they have in common? Um, what? Like yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of them are, are are kind of exhaustive search type problems. Like here, for example, um, here you're doing you're really doing some kind of computation over and over and over, namely computing the Hamming distance of a pair of vectors. Well, actually. You can also think of it as doing another kind of computation over and over. For a group of vectors here and a group of vectors here, I'm trying to find what is the pair with the minimum Hamming distance. Okay? So this is some repeated subcomputation. And this repeated subcomputation can be written in a very nice form. So for example, um, if I have like a group of s vectors here and another group of s vectors here, and I want to know, is there a vector here and a vector here? that have Hamming distance, uh, let's say, at least k, then I could write that circuit, you know, circuit-wise, as like an or over all s squared pairs, picking one from here and one from there, of a certain kind of gate, let's say, if I'm trying to find Hamming distance at most k, I'm going to have some gate, let's say, at most k, which um, is going to output 1 if and only if the sum of the bits is at most k. Okay, and then I'm going to take an XOR. So this is XOR of you know whatever bits here corresponding whatever bits here. Right? This this is just the definition of of Hamming distance. All right. So so I'll get a circuit that looks a bit like that. Okay. So what uh, Josh and I show is how to take a circuit like this and convert it uh, with decent probability into a polynomial, like a, just a an XOR of ands of a, of a certain form, which is correct on a given uh, you know, input with, with decent probability. 
Okay. Then we take this polynomial and we evaluate it over all the possible groups. Okay. And that that uses um, a fast matrix multiplication. So given a given a certain polynomial and given so now you've got like n over s different groups here, n over s different groups. We can evaluate this thing over all pairs of groups, which is like n squared over s squared, different pairs, uh, efficiently. Okay. And we can set s to be about n to the one over order log. See, and, and still get this to work. So in all of these, do, is fast matrix multiplication the thing that you end up reducing things to? Um, so where you beat direct sum, basically? The, and for most of these, yes. Um, if you, there, you could always use fast matrix mult if you want to on any of these. For, for ones like 0, 1 integer LP, there, and you can also apply this sort of thing even to SAT itself you can get away with uh, something more like an FFT. Actually, exactly this algorithm I said before about evaluating a multilinear problem with a simple divide and conquer. You can use a simple divide and conquer in some cases, depending on how your problem is set up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, but that's the key idea, is that to identify some repeated subcomputation, express it in some nice circuit form, then use this uh, polynomial method to convert that to a polynomial. Now, you could just say, why do I even have a circuit at all? Why not just convert it to a polynomial directly? Well, I mean, I just, for the purposes of thinking about it, that's, that's what we do. I mean, obviously, if you could just take the, whatever subcomputation you've got and somehow turn it directly into a nice polynomial form, that would be even better. Um, just for the purposes of thinking about the problem, is uh, easier for us to first get a circuit doing the thing that obviously does the thing and then convert it. Okay. okay. So, so I want to talk a bit about how uh, circuit lower bounds can sometimes be equivalent to circuit analysis algorithms. So, you know, this is where the red and blue really mix to become purple. So, Russell talks. Uh, quite a bit about this, so I'm only going to talk about it at a high level. Um, and, but it turns out that I guess this material is deep enough that Russell and I can say mathematically the same thing, yet uh, in English say totally different things. So, so, so uh, well, maybe not this statement, but the next one, okay. Like, oh, whatever this is, uh, I have a different way of stating what it is. So, um, but it's equivalent, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So, so I like to think of this work of uh, Russell and Valentin and Avi a while back. So they showed that there are non-trivial algorithms for the circuit approximation probability problem. So re recall this is you're given a circuit. You want to deterministically compute uh, some approximation to the fraction of satisfying assignments. Okay. So you, you can think of it as trying, as some stronger version of trying to distinguish between unsat circuits completely and circuits where you're like at least half satisfying, okay, half the satisfying. So this is true if and only if an x is not in b poly. And of course, like all the technicalities are shoved into what, <laughs> the de what non-trivial means. Okay? But the, what's very nice here is that, right, is an algorithm design problem, like taking a circuit, telling me something about the fraction of satisfying assignments. And if you sort of look at it in the right way, it is absolutely equivalent to proving circuit lower bounds, this in x not in p poly. Okay, so what does non-trivial mean? And that will occupy the rest of the slide. <laughs> okay, so, so, um, so first, uh, it's uh, going to be a non-deterministic algorithm for CAP. So it's going to, in other words, make some guesses along the way. And every single uh, uh, leaf of this non-deterministic branching where it stops, it's either going to say reject, or it's going to give you a good answer. It's going to give you a value that is actually an approximation uh, to the problem. Okay? So a non deterministic algorithm is non-trivial for CAP if for every epsilon, this algorithm, A, on a circuit C runs in uh, 2 to the n of the epsilon time on circuits of size n and uses n of the epsilon bits of advice. So it's actually a bit non-uniform itself. So to describe uh, the circuit A, which will be run on inputs of length n, 
you need into the epsilon bits to describe that algorithm. So there's some into the epsilon bits of advice being stuck in. And you think that it's specifying the program that A is going to run. Okay? And then, uh, okay, so the second condition is that this uh, thing works for infinitely many uh, circuit sizes n. So for infinitely many n, there's at least one accepting computation path on this algorithm. So this is a non-intermediate algorithm. So it's starting, you know, somewhere, and it's guessing a bunch of stuff, guessing a bunch of stuff. There's at least one accepting path, okay, for infinitely many n. There's at least one accepting path for all circuits of size n, okay? And every accepting path actually outputs an answer to the problem. Okay, it outputs a value v that's in one tenth of the acceptance probability of the circuit, which is what you, which is what you want in the cap problem. Okay? Um, so, so for infinitely many circuit sizes, it works, it does the job, and it runs in some exponential time with you know, this little extra into the epsilon bit specifying the program being run, and it's non-deterministic. Okay, I think that's, you know, that's it. <laughs> Those are all the conditions, okay? But you, an algorithm of this kind exists if and only if in X is not in P poly. Okay. Um, and it, it's really along this similar kinds of lines as we've been talking about, like, um, you can think of it as like the algorithm playing some game with the circuits, and either the circuits win or the algorithms win. If the algorithm wins, then in X is not in P poly. The circuits win, in X is in P poly, and there isn't an algorithm. So, so why can't you just try all the uh, all strings of advice here? Oh, uh, because that advice is difficult to uh, verify, to check. It's difficult to check. Um, and also, yeah. Computation. So, if you try to run it on all the different advice, for some of the advice strings, there might not be an accepting computation. But even even then, running on all the strings of advice, you have to run something to check that the advice is good. And checking even checking the advice is good seems hard. Yeah, I mean, there are actually technical ways to get rid of this advice. But if you like, um, on the next slide, <laughs> but. But uh, those those become even more com convoluted, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you change cap to like circuit class cap, do you get an X not in that circuit class? Uh, yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think it works like. Have certain closure properties, but okay. Yeah, but but all the ones we even like like yeah, it wouldn't like necessarily preserve exactly say the depth or something of the thing, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, now the but the next. Uh, Slide it does have this property, like for even. Uh, I don't think. I mean, if there are any closure properties required, they're extremely minimal. But I haven't really, really thought about it. Um, okay, any more questions about this statement? Okay, so um, so something I proved, which. I believe this is supposed to be equivalent to this, is uh, there are non-trivial algorithms for the minimum circuit size problem if and only if NX is not NP poly. So, um, so you can think of actually natural properties. Really, uh, I think uh, the previous lecture I mentioned this says natural properties as being pretty good algorithms for the minimum circuit size problem. Right? Their natural properties are these things that take true tables of functions input, they take the same kind of input as this minimum circuit size problem, um, and they tell you something non-trivial about the circuit complexity. Okay? For a natural property, it would be that on a random string, it will say hard okay, with decent probability, and on all the strings with low circuit complexity, whatever that means, you know, depending on what you're trying to prove a lower bound against, it will say easy. Okay? So it sort of just returns a single bit, you know, hard or easy, and, um, and it runs in polynomial time. Okay. So, so what do I mean by non-trivial here? So, um, as Russell was saying, like this this kind of thing. So, without the barely, this kind of thing uh, needs uh, to work on uh, one over 
to the order n fraction of inputs of, let's say, n-bit functions. Okay. So these are to the n bit strings. Okay. And we're just going to get rid of this condition. And we're going to also add some infinitely often stuff. And then all of a sudden, just having something. Uh, so basically, having a polynomial time algorithm that's useful infinitely often is going to be equivalent to nx sine p poly. So, so we say that algorithm A is non-trivial for the minimum circuit size problem. If for all constants k, uh, this algorithm on the, a truth table uh, f runs in polynomial time. So let's say 2 to the n is the you know, size of f, so only Boolean function f to the n bits, and it uses n bits of advice. Now, if you allow the algorithm to run on things which are not of length 2 to the n, and it sort of truncated things are rounded up to the nearest power to the end. You could actually get rid of this advice, but you know that's that, that's just an extra point. Okay, if you're worried about advice, there are ways to sort of get around it. Okay, and for infinitely many n, uh, this algorithm is going to to be non-trivial. It's going to work. So for there's going to be a, some Boolean function of two to the n bits on which it outputs one. So think of one as saying hard. And on all functions computable with the polynomial size circuits, this in the k size circuit, it's going to output zero. It's going to say it's easy. You see, this is like very, very weak. So instead of saying it needs to work on a, a good fraction of the inputs, I'm just requiring it works on one. It just works, it has to work on one function. It has to say at least one function is hard, and all the easy things are easy, and I don't know about the rest. And I'm doing this for infinitely many uh, n. Okay. Um, and I, but I run in polynomial time just as Rosbroff and Rudich would have liked. Okay. Right. And this uh, turns out to be absolutely equivalent to nx on p poly. And uh, yeah, I think if you look at what Russell was arguing in the right way, you, 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 will, you will see this. I mean, I think it's more or less a restatement. It's just, you know, yeah, in, the, in different terms. Um, okay. Yeah. So the main contrast is natural proofs, and natural proofs would require that uh, for a good fraction of Boolean functions, the thing outputs one. That's really the, the, the only difference. I mean, for at least like having a polynomial time constructed thing with a, say, a log size of input bits of advice. Okay. All right. So, um, so I'll. Because I was going to spend more time talking about this, because I, I saw Russell's lecture, I began modifying my slides, and so I'm going to talk about uh, something else uh, as well. It's some recent work uh, with one of my PhD students, Bernard Chapman. Um, it's a it's a little um, uh, mind bending, so I'll try to go a bit slower. I mean it's. Depending on how you look at it, it's either mind bending or it's trivial. So, but I think at the beginning it will be. <laughs> so the idea is to think of lower bounds in some kind of dual way as a, as a design problem, where you're trying to design certain data sets that are good for testing whether circuits compute a function. OK, I'll just go slow here. So, so this is work, uh, joint work with Primor Chapman. It is a new kind of equivalence between algorithms and complexity. The whole idea behind these kinds of equivalences really is to try to remove this mentality that lower bounds are something you know in something so non constructive that like there is an algorithmic constructive way of looking at lower bounds there is something you get there is some object you get from proving a lower bound now what is it right so the, all these kinds of results are trying to do this this is of a similar flavor um, so okay, so let f be some. Uh, function we'd like to compute. You know, initially, f is just um, over infinite uh, input. So let uh, c be some simple class of Boolean circuits. Now we want to sort of test whether a given uh, circuit from this class is computing our desired function on some slice of that function, depending on the number of inputs to our circuit. So we're going to define a, a problem of this kind. So we define c test for f to be the following problem. Okay, so our input is going to be a circuit, C, from this class. And we'll let n of C be the number of inputs to C. Okay, so that's just given as part of the input of the problem. There is some number n of, the, of inputs to that thing. 
what we want to decide is whether C computes F on uh, all n, bit, n of C bit strings. Okay? So like I give you the circuit that, and, I, and it has some number of inputs. I want to know, does it compute F on the slice? Yes or no? Okay. Right, so this is an extremely well-motivated problem, obviously. Uh, like we think of it, F as some specification, something we would like to compute. And we want to verify if C meets the specification, okay? as given. Right. Okay. So, so it, it's another kind of meta-algorithmic problem okay. that hasn't really, I mean, I haven't found much literature on it. I would be happy to, to uh, uh, know of uh, more references about it. So this is, yeah. a, like, you, you think of f as some fixed function. So for every yeah. class of functions, you Yeah, there is a C test for f. Yeah. For every fixed circuit class and for every fixed function, this is your problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could ask, you know, you could ask, um, does C compute the, you know, whatever, like uh, the all zeros function, <laughs> right, right? And it become, it, that becomes a SAT problem, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it computes the all zeros function, yeah. for to give a specific example, right? So if it computes the all zeros function, it's on SAT, right? This, that's the same, all right? All right. So this is uh, the problem stated again. So. So how are we going to measure the complexity of such a problem? Well, uh, we were thinking about it, and well, this is kind of a, a problem where, um, so at the beginning we would like to compute a function f by giving you a circuit, and that's our computer, and then we're going to get inputs, and, that, and it's going to give us the thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip inputs and programs here. So the circuit used to be the program, now it's the input. We're going to gauge uh, the complexity of this test problem by measuring the number of inputs needed to test if a given circuit computes the function. Okay? So now the inputs are becoming the program. Okay? And so we call this data complexity. Okay? So uh, the data complexity. Yes? Inputs to C. Yes, yes, yes. If a given circuit. Yeah, so, this is, so these are inputs to C. So think of these as N of C bit strings for different uh, Cs. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. You're given a well before the only thing you're really given here. So maybe when I give the definition, you will see what's there. You're given one parameter basically. You're given the circuit size, and now you have to prepare this collection of inputs. It's going to work on all size s circuits. You don't have the number of inputs. You have the circuit size. Okay, and this is actually a very subtle but a, a key point to the thing. So the data complexity of this test problem is going to be some function, actually, yeah, t. So t of s is going to be the minimum number of labeled examples. So I'm just going to give you a labeled example. I'm going to give you x, an input, and give you f of x, the output. Okay? Give you some number of labeled examples. And I want to know what's the minimum number necessary and sufficient to determine for every c of size s whether c computes f on all of its relevant inputs. Right? So for every c, there's some number of inputs to it. I want to know what's the minimum number of labeled examples uh, necessary and efficient for size s. So the only parameter here is the circuit size s. Okay. So I'm I'm going to have to give you examples for you know different lengths of inputs, right? Like, be, be, like for all the different n of c there could be, I'm going to have to give you some x's of that n of c length and x of another you know say n prime length. But I want to know what's the total number the minimum number of labeled examples that will work for every circuit of size s, no matter how many inputs it has. Okay? All right? So this is also well motivated. All right? So small data complexity means that we can rapidly determine if a given circuit computes f. In fact, this is often the way programs are tested in practice, just running a bunch of inputs. Make sure you get the right output. Okay? So this is like a, a formalization of this, like of the sort of quick and dirty testing. Like, uh, just try a bunch of inputs and outputs, and see if they work. Okay, I want the minimum number of things. So, so and all I've got to go on is the the circuit size. So every, the only thing I know in advance is like what the circuit size is. I gave you a budget of S gates. Go make a circuit. Maybe I don't even, you know, I don't even know how many inputs you're going to be able to stick at the bottom. Well, in fact, that determines the circuit complexity, right? So, the, the, so this is this is intimately related to the circuit complexity, uh, the data complexity. 
Um, but is at least this sort of clear at a, at a high level? I think I have a, yet another slide that gives the definition too, but yeah. This is more analogous to like a hitting set than... Yeah, you want to hit the circuits that don't compute it yeah. in a certain sense. Yeah, for all the circuits that don't compute it, you want to have some label example that, that, that tricks it, that fools it, like, oh, oops, you got the wrong answer. Yeah? Is this adaptive examples or non-adaptive? Oh, uh, it, I, I just made, we just said it in a non-adaptive way. You could have some sort of adaptive kind of tree thing, uh, but you could just take the, what was it? As soon as you see an example where c of x is different from f of x. You're done. Yeah, yeah, so your tree would look like that. I mean, like, kind of like a line. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So that would be interesting from a, maybe some kind of approximation point of view, if you want to know if a circuit approximately gets it or something, right? But yeah. 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 So what's the connection to machine learning here? Because you get a what labeled examples, and then you're somehow... Yeah, something. yeah. So, I mean, there is some connection uh, to machine learning, So, but it's often, like, done in a different way. Like, in machine learning, you don't know what the what the program is. You don't know what the function is, okay? You want to learn what the function is from the examples. Here, the function is like part of the definition of the problem. Now you want to like talk about programs, all, all the possible programs that could compute the function and do it. So like, right, you, you, so there's this notion of teaching dimension, which is for like concept class and stuff, but yeah, they, these things are like just more or less orthogonal as far as I can tell because because the function is unknown, and you want to figure out what it is, basically. Yeah? I mean, as far as machine learning goes, isn't yeah. this like just a program verification problem? Yes. Like query complexity? Yes, yes. It's like a, it's a program verification problem. It's not entirely black box because of this S, because of the circuit size S. Yeah, that, that's what makes it non-black box. Well, I mean, you know, when you're given a program, you kind of yes. have a, you know, it's going to be of a certain size. Exactly. So I, I, yeah, so, so it seems almost as black box as you could be, but it's not exactly black box. Like the, it actually is, it's like the minimum amount of information for that you get a non-trivial notion. I'm going to argue this is non-trivial, yeah. <laughs> um, are you looking at uniform or non-uniform? So, so given S, do you have to be able to compute this set of examples? Oh, no, it's just the minimum number of label examples, totally non-uniform. Okay. You know, so, I don't know, you know, they just drop down from heaven, just like the circuits do. <laughs> Non-uniform circuits do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, putting computability bounds on them would be an interesting thing, like sort of how that relates to uniform circuits. I haven't even thought about this problem. Neither has Ben Morris. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay? All right. Uh, okay, so, so here's an informal statement of the theorem we can prove. So for every function, okay, um, lower bounds on the data complexity of testing uh, for that function, for any given circuit class, really, are equivalent to upper bounds on the circuit complexity of the function. Okay? So if you lower bound, the, if you show that you need at least so much data as a function of the circuit size to test it, you have given an upper bound on the circuit complexity. Okay? And just to restate that, you know, for maximum emphasis, Upper, upper bounds to data complexity uh, are equivalent to lower bounds in CRM. So, so if you want to prove lower bounds, you just have to give uh, nice uh, data test sets. Okay, just show there is a data test set that is that is not too large. Okay, there's just something that's constructive you could lay out and you could potentially verify. Okay, and that would give you a lower bound. Okay. Um, so, so these kind of duals, I think of this providing some sort of uh, alternate universe where like the inputs become the computational model, like you're testing, like uh, the, your program is like the set of labeled examples, and the circuits become the inputs. And so when you, you flip it this way, upper bounds become lower bounds, and so then, you know, then you wonder, well, I mean, of course everything here is non-uniform, okay? So that, so I mean, it's still not the, we're not, I'm not saying that like algorithms equal circuit complexity or something like that, because like, again, algorithms are something that we design one of and then we let it, you know, it will run on everything. But this is still a non-uniform notion of an algorithm giving you a lower bound. Okay. All right. Because like one, yes, if like if F has a size S circuit. Yes. And you're able to like XOR with something. Yes. You could make a circuit that's equal to F except on one point. Yes. And then you need 
Yes, that uh, that gives you at least one direction. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me. Uh, well, okay. So I have this example, and then I, then I'll say a little bit more details. So, for example, the following things are equivalent. So, um, NP is not NP poly, or maybe NP is not infinitely often NP poly. So, uh, not even the case of infinitely many input links, you can get a polynomial size circuit. So that's this is totally equivalent to saying the following: for every epsilon and for infinitely many s, okay, or respectively for every s, if you want to prove that lower bound, the data complexity of testing size of circuits for SAT is in most two to the s the epsilon. So proving NP not NP poly is equivalent to proving a sub-exponential upper bound on the data complexity of testing SAT circuits. So I give you a circuit. I want to know. Does it solve the SAT problem, yes or no? Okay, it's of size S. How many, how many examples of you know, Boolean formulas do I need to give it before I can tell you for sure whether or not it computes the SAT problem or not on that slice? Okay, this is sub-exponential if and only if NP is not NP poly. Okay, um, so, so although we prove these kind of generic statements, it's open as far as I know, I mean, if whether we can use data complexity to recover even, uh, so recover, say, new proofs of, say, old circuit lower bounds. Like, take, for example, the proof that parity, um, the circuit complexity of parity on and, or, and not, of n and 2 is exactly 3 times n minus 1. Okay? If you want to compute the parity function on, on and, or, and not. You want to compute mod two. mod two. So it's exactly this. So in principle, uh, you should be able to give a data complexity proof of this by giving some upper bound on the data complexity, some some uh, sub-exponential upper bound on the data complexity that proves uh, the lower bound for this. So there's even giving any kind of proof that uses this data complexity notion of any circuit lower bound. I think it would be interesting because um, it, it just seems like uh, you would think maybe okay you can just recover it from the known proofs, but uh, it's not it's not so it's not so easy. There is some loss in going between these kind of two things. So the three n minus one. Yeah, this is for computing mod two with n or not and fin n two. Oh okay. So okay. like for example for on for two uh, variables it takes. An and of ors of two of variables in the gate. We're not counting not gates, just ands and ors. Free, right? What's that? It's not coming for free. Yeah, with not coming for free. The usual, the usual counting. Yeah, that we do. Yeah. yeah. So this would be like you know some sort of baby example to try to understand what data complex is doing. Sort of similar to how like people are tr trying to use like get just even the basic sort of obstructions. Uh, in geometric complexity theory, just to recover, you know, small proofs uh, of lower bounds for uh, matrix multiplication. So can you prove a recap of lower bound? Oh, uh, I think Ben Moore can probably prove something, but I don't remember what he proved. Like he he had, he ran some computer search to sort of like find the uh, good uh, data sets. I think he proved something, but he really wanted to get exactly that, and so it, it's a little tricky. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it obvious why you should be parameterizing by the size of the circuit and not like? The no, it's not at all obvious. It looks weird, um, <laughs> but it but it's sort of yeah, like it's sort of in retrospect, it, it gives you what you want. Like that. Well, I mean, the intuition that the like the intuition maybe in hindsight is that the input is the input to the test com, the testing problem is of length roughly s, okay. And so this is like as a function of, of the input. Um, yeah. So it probably would even be nicer if you actually said the you know the optimal coding of an of a size S circuit. Oh, it depends on what you. I, I think you're going to be involved. The number of circuits of, on N inputs of size S is going to come right into it because you're going to look at it like a hard set. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And to get the equivalence, yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Just for a quick second, can you, yeah. can you go back one slide? Yes. Okay. So I will state formal versions of these things, um, I believe, on the next slide. 
If not, I will skip the slide and, and then state it. Uh, let's see. So let, let f be as before, and let s, say, be at least like 2n, okay, just to make things nice. So this will be the circuit size we want. So that, again, the data complexity of testing size of circuits for f, just to say it again, it's the minimum number of inputs needed to distinguish circuits of size f, computing a slice of f, sorry, compute, circuit size s, computing a slice of f, circuits of size s that don't. Okay. You just want to know the minimum number of inputs of any potential size. So that any potential number of, like if this thing has n of c, we're going to have some inputs of length n of c among these things. Okay. Okay. So the first theorem is that if a function f has circuits of size s of n, okay, then the data complexity of testing size of circuits for f is to the omega s inverse of s, almost everywhere. Okay. So basically, when you unpack this statement, it's sort of like what Russell was saying. I'll say more in a moment. Okay. So basically, getting uh, having a circuit upper bound automatically gives you some kind of lower bound on the data complexity, but you take the inverse of the function here. Uh, and then, conversely, if we manage to prove that f is not in size slightly larger than s of n, okay, then we can upper bound the data complexity. Okay? So the data complexity of testing size of circuits for f is at most order 2 to this s of inverse s things is some exponential thing, plus some small polynomial in s, well, times this s of inverse of s, okay, infinitely often. Okay? So when you sort of go backwards and, and look at uh, the previous slides, this basically is saying things like, if you've got a, a function f, it's in p poly, if and only if uh, its data complexity um, is at least 2 to the s to the epsilon for some epsilon. All right. um, so I'll give some very vague proof sketches of these things, but hopefully it will at least get you started thinking about how, how these things get proved. Okay. So here's some ideas. So the first theorem looks a bit weird, but it actually has a really, really simple proof. I mean, it's really, really easy. So if you've got a function and it has circuits of size s of n, okay? So it's already got circuits of size s of n. Then for every n-bit input x, there's a circuit slightly larger say s of n plus n, which disagrees with f only at x. Okay. This is like a pretty simple exercise. Like the idea, you have your circuit of size s of n, you have this sort of exception case with n gates, which says, oh, oh, if your input happens to be exactly this x, then just do the opposite thing. Okay, so you just have these extra n gates that do the opposite thing. Okay? So this says that when, um, so when you have this kind of upper bound, it's going to be very hard to test. Uh, whether the thing is computing f or not. Okay? So it follows from this that essentially every test set for circuits of size slightly larger than s of n, say s of n plus n, is going to have cardinality at least 2 to the n. Because if you don't include like this example x in there, then, right, then there's a circuit that could get the rest of it right, but get that one wrong. Okay? So, so having this Having this circuit upper bound for f gives you some lower bound and says, okay, you know, if your circuit size s, if like, um, right, if if your circuit size s is big enough that you can actually start to compute this function f, then you're going to have to try all two to the n inputs. You have to put all two to the n inputs in in your test set and tell me what what the value is on everything. Okay, all right. So that's a, so that's a lower bound. All right. Now to go the opposite direction is a is a bit trickier. Okay, so here we want to say if you don't have circuits slightly larger than S, then I can give you some nice sort of counterexample set that will allow you to, to uh, you know, test circuits for F uh, efficiently. Okay, and so the idea behind this, which appears in, in lots of different papers actually, um, in, in various uh, ways, maybe sometimes implicitly, uh, is that if you have f, if f doesn't have circuits of size, let's say 2n times s of n, then for all circuits of size s of n, so this is a slightly smaller circuit size, you can get a small test set that will 
because no circuit of size s of n will compute f for sure, because f doesn't have even 2n times s of n size circuits. But it, moreover, like because we chose s of n to be strictly smaller than what we know the lower bound to be, we can in fact have a small set of counterexamples, a small set of x's and f of x's that will fool, that will say rule out all circuits of size s of n. Okay? So um, there are various ways to prove this. And Bryn Moore and I use this from a more general theorem about uh, a zero-sum game between circuits and inputs. Okay. So that's the Lipton Young paper. Yeah, 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 but Lipton and Young also prove something like this. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, for size S circuits, so, so I'm just trying to say more intuition about these two theorems here, okay? So for size S circuits, where the number of inputs in is sort of too large to compute the function. So right, you imagine the circuit size S is fixed now. So whether or not I'm going to be able to compute a slice of f actually depends on the number of inputs to that circuit, not, not the size. Okay? So if, this, yeah, right, if, it, if the number of inputs were like log of the size, then I can always compute the function. Right? Every, I mean, every function ha has 2 to the n size circuits. Okay? So if the number of inputs is too large to compute f, if it's too large, it would mean the circuit is small as the number of in, function of inputs. We have small test sets. That's what this thing says. We get the small counterexample family. Okay? And we will include all those small test sets. That's where we get this extra n squared, sorry, s squared factor here. Then for size of circuits where n is small enough, where it's really small, and, we, and when, once n becomes small enough, we can actually compute a slice of f. Then, well, it becomes possible to compute f with size s, and then we have to include all possible inputs. So, so the way this thing is saying is that, um, like your test set, your minimum test set is going to look like the following. When the... Uh, when the n is small enough, you're going to have all possible inputs, labeled examples, up to a certain point where you're reaching the circuit complexity. Okay? Once n gets large enough, you can start having sort of polynomial size test sets as a, in terms of the circuit size that will, that will distinguish. Okay? And so overall, like, you're more or less pinning down things exactly where the circuit complexity happens. Yeah? Could you, could you sort of like relate this to the VC dimension of size S circuits? Oh, because well, you, you know, if you're so basically saying, you know, the VC dimension of size S circuits is about S log S, and um, so like there's a set of inputs on which um, knowing the values on that input um, determine which which cir which function, you know, if it's fun commutable by size S, yeah, it determines exactly which function it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's something, something like that. So, yeah, sort of right around the circuit complexity, you go from, like, having to include all 2 to the n possible examples to having to only include a polynomial number of examples of the function of circuit size. Yeah. So that, this is the, the, the basic idea behind how, how you prove this. Um, yeah, but you feel free to, you know, ask me uh, later in, in person. More about it. Um, so I guess I want to conclude with some uh, general questions to, to think more about about these things. So how can algorithms help prove lower bounds? So how can properties of circuits be turned into algorithms for, for analyzing them? Okay. Um, and how can lower bounds help design algorithms? Okay. So we've seen, uh, at least at a high level, lots of different examples of these two kinds of things. And so the whole thesis here is that we can make progress uh, on both algorithms and lower bounds by studying them as a unit, not as sort of two separate things, but as things that sort of naturally relate to each other. And that, you know, when you prove a lower bound in one way, it can give you an algorithm for a different kind of thing. And they seem much more related than sort of the artificial uh, boundaries we've drawn from them. And in, in the next lecture, I'll give you an explicit example of this. In, in Hopefully, lots of detail, uh, the, namely the proof that NX is not in ACC. Okay, uh, and I'll stop here for the day. So, in the case of of uh, use that you had of Rasparov Smolensky, sort of, you could at one sense say, well, that was kind of a lucky accident. Their proof technique happened to be useful for all of these problems. It, it proved more than somehow is, is necessary 
really, and you know, maybe it used, did much more than was necessary to actually prove the circuit separation. And I yeah. don't know what your, your take is on sort of thinking about yeah. that. Yeah, well, there are more examples than just Rosbroff and Smolensky. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, like random the random restriction and all the new ideas that have, been gone, that have gone into proving concentration bounds there have you know, given new set algorithms for lots of different classes we didn't know anything for. So, I mean, it's possible that the random restriction stuff could be applied in a similar broad way. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, but yeah, I guess, but even there you could say, oh, well, you know, they, they were proving something stronger than what they really needed, whatever. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, at least, in, even in a black box way, we have some equivalences, sort of saying that you've got to have at least this kind of weak algorithm with all these, like, provisos and stuff. Whereas, I don't, I'm not sure anyone's going to actually look for algorithms exactly all those little properties. They're going to try to get an algorithm that's like maybe not infinitely often, because who knows what you could do infinitely often. Just do it almost everywhere. And like, OK, I don't know what advice to pick, so I'm not going to use advice. And so maybe I'll prove a lower bound that way. In fact, like that's sort of how the ACC lower bound goes. So I mean, it might just be that you know maybe we're not doing the minimum necessary to prove lower bounds, but that's just because <laughs> like maybe even finding that is like harder than just getting something that works. So, so <laughs> using, using algorithmic thinking and designing lower bounds in some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to me, it seems that the the general principle is that uh, you get a circuit which uh, is uh, small and. Uh, uh, and you use this property that it is small to do something with the circuit and make it even much, much simpler. So either you're yeah. by random restriction and you get very simple things, yeah. or you just approximate it and you get simple things which are polynomials. Yeah. And this clearly should help to, to solve algorithmic problems because uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. So you drew this picture of well, if this is a general form of your problem at the bottom, then yeah, the yeah. polynomial method will give you a speed up. Yeah. Uh, can this be formalized into a meta theorem? Like, if your problem is for each pair do a computation of this form, then yeah. So what would the form of computation be? Like just an AC zero circuit? Oh yeah. Um, it could even be like you know an ACC circuit. You could probably. I mean, you could. Take. I mean, it's hard to figure out like what, what is like the max uh, maxima of this like set of like you know what is the strongest circuit. But there are lots of different results, and yeah, sort of any time you have um, this kind of circuit that you can put in some nice polynomial-like form, which makes it easy to evaluate either by matrix multiple or by an FFT, then you, if this is like some compute, this is sort of some repeated subcomputation going on there. Then yeah, you can you can sort of do this repeated subcomputation many times by using the fact that matrix multiplication can do a repeated subcomputation many times efficiently. I mean, it's sort of it's just you know kind of a reduction, bootstrapping off the fact that in matrix multiplication you're doing a bunch of inner products uh, efficiently altogether. Um, but it's really sort of a, identifying a bottleneck like this. So for all pair shortest paths, let's say in the real RAM, it's not at all clear like what your bottleneck computation is. If you kind of unpack like things and you use like Fredman's trick and all this stuff from the previous all pair shortest path algorithm, you do get some kind of circuit that you can think of as being computed many, many times over. And yeah, anytime you have this kind of repeated some computation, you can speed up that part of it at least. This kind of <clears throat> FFT like thing, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, sort of for circuits. It's like a decomposition for circuits, which makes them, yeah, like. It makes it possible to evaluate the circuit on many points uh, fast, faster than just trying each one. Yeah. yeah Russell, you had a question? Well, is there any way you could view this? See, it's not a meta algorithm, but is there some kind of like meta algorithm, like circuits at for depth 2, um, AC0, you know, depth, yeah. depth 2 threshold circuits of a given kind? Yeah. That, um, you could view this as a reduction to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, depending on you know my mood and when I was writing the paper, I either wrote it that way or I didn't. I mean, like, yeah. yeah um, I mean, in in general, it's like you uh, the like the print the basic principle behind all these things is that 
you have some repeated sim computation. It's got two kinds of inputs, let's say X and Y inputs, and, and, it, and the circuit is restricted in some particular form, some form that we knew how to analyze thanks to lots of circuit complexity work. Um, yeah, and then, it, then the theorem is that you can evaluate the circuit on all pairs of inputs, like say one from one set, like n, and one from another set, n, in time uh, about n squared. You know, here we're sort of shrinking it so that these are n over s and these are n over s. Yeah, there's certainly this very generic uh, statement sitting underneath it all. <laughs>